excited to present our guest author tonight. Dr. Michael Rosen is the Chief Wellness Officer at the Cleveland Clinic. He is a four-time number one New York Times bestselling author and co-founder and originator of the Real Age concept. He co-authored, along with Dr. Oz, the popular You series of books and is the Chief Medical Consultant to The Dr. Oz Show. We're delighted and grateful that he was able to come out to Newport Beach um, from Ohio, just flew in this morning. Um, this has been a long time coming um, and presenting his new book, it just came out on the 13th, The Great Age Reboot. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Michael Roizen. Is, yeah, this is on. I want to acknowledge someone in the audience who shaped my life. Candy Amwan is here. She was the producer on the first time I was on Oprah and subsequent times. And it was the first TV show I had ever done. And so um, in the break, there's an eight minute segment and there were, I think, six segments there, eight, seven, six, five, four, or whatever it is. She came out and in the guise of Adjust, it was live then, live to tape, if you will. It was a sweeps week. So there were, um, I believe, seven, uh, if you will, permanent um, TV cameras, but there were I think 11 handhelds that day. And uh, she came out and in the guise of adjusting my tie said, you've got to get more animated. Um, and I said, I thought she was supposed to be. And she said, no, you were, you are. Um, and so I said, can I say anything? And she said, yeah. And she probably doesn't remember this, but she said, only your friends in Chicago will know because that's where we're live. Um, and they may think you're dumb, but we'll edit it out in the rest of the place. Uh, so Oprah had done her real age test, and so Oprah comes back, and the start of the second segment was supposed to be, what can I do to get younger? Um, and so I said, Oprah, you've got to floss your teeth more, um, drink red wine, uh, drink more wine, and uh, have more sex. Um, <laughs> And at which point, uh, then in the break in the next segment, Oprah ran with that. Um, and uh, we were neck and neck with Jerry Springer um, for uh, during the, uh, if you will, sweeps week. Um, and uh, when we came back in about the fourth segment, in the Oprah audience, there are 300 seats, 304 seats, 300 women, four guys. And um, she went to a guy like this, and there's a hand held on him, and, and she said, does sex make your real age younger, sir? And he said, Oprah, I haven't had it in so long, I wouldn't know. <laughs> that wasn't the key. It was the look his wife gave him at that point. Like, and you're never going to. Um, and uh, so at that point, I learned that I can say anything in front of the crowd, um, uh, as long as I stick with the science. So, um, so thank you, Candy. Um, so the uh, where this comes is that we have extended we being public health and medical science life expectancy by about two and a half years every decade since 1890. Initially, it was due to sanitation and public health. And by the way, it's a relatively straight line function. This is life expectancy here. We've gone from around 43. Men are in green. They're always shorter lived than women. Um, and then more recently, it's been due to um, the management of chronic disease like hypertension and type 2 diabetes, et cetera. But in the next 10 years, we're likely to get a exponential jump in a single decade of 30 years. Um, and that, I love doing this, so I'm going to do it again. Um, <laughs> meaning, um, and what that means 
is if you expected to live to 80, change that. If you make it this 10 years, you're likely to give to 100, live to 110 or more. And that's due to the exponential research into the mechanism of aging. Now, what that does is it changes everything because it changes where you'll live, it changes how long you'll work, because you're not going to be old. You're going to get rebooted back if any of the animal research that has now shown that we can reboot two animal species for each of these 14 things comes and is able to be done in humans. So um, when people say, what do I mean by this exponential change? Well, if you do linear steps and you do 30 linear steps, you get 30 yards closer to where you're going. But if you do 30 exponential steps, 1, 2, 4, 8, 16, 32, you end up 26 times around the Earth. That's how fast the research in this area is progressing. Um, and so we expect, with an 80% probability, that since there are 14 shots on goal, you're going to get to live a lot younger, longer. So it's essentially, what I'm saying is old age isn't going to be old, which requires a huge mind shift. Um, so do you remember how you were, sir? Do you remember what it was like to be 40? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, well, you may get that chance again. So the point is, the first third of the book is on the, the science that is progressing in the 14 areas. The next third is on the economics and policy changes and how it really saves um, Medicare, Social Security, et cetera, and why it saves them and what you can do about it for yourself. And the last third is how to plan for it. But let me go through and briefly say, if you're 55 now, and when you were born, your life expectancy was 74. Your really life expectancy now is 82. We extend it about two and a half years every decade. Um, and, but you're likely to live to 115. Or you got 60 more years with an 80% probability. Um, but, and they're going to be younger years. That's the amazing thing. And that's what I'll show you a little bit of the science. So this is supposed to be a scissors cutting out a gene or replacing it. So we've got gene editing. Um, it was patented in 2000 and uh, I believe it was 11. The same week patents were filed by Harvard MIT group and a UC Berkeley group and they're still fighting over it. Um, but what, how much does it cost to do gene editing? It costs five bucks for a whole animal. For you, it would cost five bucks in raw material. Now, they're going to charge a lot more, um, at least initially, but it isn't expensive. So let's show you what it does. So let me give you an example. Elimination of a gene mutation in the liver that produces an abnormal amyloid that causes 25 to 30% of heart failure. Um, the people who this was done in had less than six months projected to live. They had ejection fractions of around 12%. That means when their heart squeezed, it only squeezed out 12% of the blood that was in it. They basically had to be in bed or at best in a chair. They edited out this gene. It's a gene that normally doesn't make this protein, but it got an abnormality and it made this protein that caused heart failure. Now, um, guess what? In seven of the 12 people in whom it was done in Australia, wasn't perfectly successful, 
but seven of the 12 now have ejection fractions over 35%. They can chase their grandchildren, and instead of having a life expectancy of six months, they now have 35%. I'm sorry, they now have a life expectancy of 18 years. That's not atypical of what's happening. Let me give you another example. The gene that produces your abnormal risk for heart disease, if you've got an elevated LDL, is a gene that many of us have that inhibits your liver from getting rid of the LDL. It isn't you produce too much, it stays in your body too long because you have this abnormal gene. Many of us do. Well, guess what? We can edit that out now. And the first person, and Imagine eliminating 40% of the cause of death. All heart disease or much heart disease and stroke. That first person got that gene edited out in July in New Zealand. Um, let me give you another, and by the way, 75 of the 76 people with beta thalassemia got this treatment and why did they get another gene that knocked out the beta thalassemia cause, or the cause of beta thalassemia, which is an abnormal hemoglobin? Because they were having to go to the emergency room every week for a transfusion. They were 15 to 20 years old. Their life expectancy was at best 25. Well, guess what? 75 of the 76 got it and got rid of that and now have a life expectancy over 65. By the way, I told you it costs $5. They want, the company wants to charge a million too for the treatment, but it's only $5 worth of stuff. Um, it'll come down, uh, most of us believe. Anyway, um, just imagine if we found the genes that cause aging I'm picking on you, sir, um, so that you could get back to age 40. Guess what? That's close. So this is just one of the 14 areas that is going to allow this, we think, to occur. Um, it all started with the Human Genome Project. Um, both Craig Venter's group, which was a private group, and the Collins group at NIH expected um, to find 300,000 genes based on the amount of DNA in your nuclei. But they found only 22,500. What did they call the rest of the DNA? They called it junk DNA. Both groups agreed on it. But what was found eight years later was that it was switches, just like a rheostat on the wall, that you get to control which of your genes are on or not. They're switches for your genes. And what that has turned out to be is that those switches you get to control to a large degree if you want to. 80% of them you control. The other 20% are what medicine is learning how to control, such as in the thalassemia, beta thalassemia story. Let me give you an example. All genes really do is make proteins. So you've learned that a little bit with mRNA. mRNA runs up against your DNA if the DNA, if the switch allows it to, and it then translates to the rest of your cell that protein structure and keeps making proteins. That's how you're protected against, with the vaccines, against the virus. It makes an antibody to it. Well, guess what? You get to control it in the vast majority of cases whether that gene is on or not. We used to think if you exercised, um, you would improve your cardiovascular system, and that would improve blood flow would be good for your brain, and it is. But guess what? When you exercise and stress a muscle, 
you turn on a gene that makes a small protein called arisen that in turn goes to your brain and releases brain-derived neurotrophic growth factor, so it causes your, which is like miracle growth for your hippocampus. The hippocampus is the only organ in the body where size matters. It grows for memory, and so it keeps you having memory. So what happens is when you stress your muscles, you produce arisen, arisen in turn turns on brain-derived neurotrophic growth factor, and that means you're much less likely to develop dementia if you stress your muscles regularly. It's not just blood flow. It is we're now learning which genes you turn on by which actions. What it means is you may not have gone to Caltech, but you're a better genetic engineer than any of they, them are for you. So we really have two processes that cause us to get older. One is genes that are off get turned on, or get ones that should be on get turned off, or you lose cells, or the cells malfunction. And what we're learning is how to get you to do this or us to do that, meaning reverse that process by epigenetic changes or to hack the cells or to repair them or to get rid of them so you make new cells. And that's how this is working to get you to live longer and younger. So I didn't see a young person here. Are you 25 yet? 24. So you're going to live to 130. Um, but most of those years will be young. Um, so meaning this is really stretching the period between 20 and 60 to between 20 and probably 100. Um, and I'm going to give you some examples of mice that have been rebooted from 107-week-old mice, the equivalent of a 100-year-old human, to 40-week-old mice, the equivalent of 35-year-old human, the experiments haven't been done a second time yet to know whether we're going to get rebooted more than once. But you're likely, since they're 14 shots on goal, with an 80% probability to be able to be rebooted younger at least once. Or to function like a 40-year-old at calendar age 90. Now, at this point, someone in the audience says, what about my skin? <laughs> um, and the answer is, yeah, it's every organ. So I'll come back to it. If you look at the mice, as you'll see in some of the pictures, it's every organ. Let me tell you some of the crazy things. So we think um, one of the keys is how do we prevent abnormal proteins from attaching to your brain cells or the supporting structure and causing Alzheimer's disease. So amyloid and tau are a leading thing that we think causes it. So the Cleveland Clinic, because it's got the quantum computer of IBM on our campus, um, looked at every drug approved by the FDA and that was generic. And there's some 1,500 of them. And what they found was, if you will, Viagra, that's its other name, blocks the associated, women get it for pulmonary hypertension, men for erectile dysfunction. It blocked 69% of the, it had a 69% effect in blocking amyloid and tau from attaching to brain cells. And then they looked in a 15 million person database we have and they found that those men who had received that as opposed to Cialis, or women who had gotten that treatment for pulmonary hypertension as opposed to another, had a 69% reduction in dementia over their life. So that's being done prospectively, and it's a generic drug. What about a water pill? So the people at the Gladstone Institute did the same thing, Gladstone Institute at UC San Francisco, 
did the same thing, and bumetidine, bumetanide, does exactly the same thing, in fact, a little better, 70% instead of 69%. Um, and so there are randomized trials now, and in a 12 million person database, it blocked it 70% of the time as well. So in a randomized trial, both are being used in large groups of elderly people who don't have dementia to see if they can prevent it from occurring. Pretty interesting, right? That is the area called proteostasis. How do we inhibit abnormal proteins, just a little abnormal? The difference, matter of fact, if you looked at it from an ApoE4, which increases dementia risk threefold, to an ApoE2, which decreases dementia risk twofold, sixfold difference, is one lousy DNA letter. So can you edit that out and change it? And the answer is yes, you can do that in mice now. And that'll be starting human trials pretty soon too. So the goal here is for you to understand, the goal of the book is for you to understand, the goal of my talking to you is to understand why 90 is likely to be the new 40 adopt behaviors that change outcomes so you'll be around and be healthy for that. Why do I say that? Because in 2050, you may go in a car wash as a 90-year-old and come out as a 50-year-old on the other side of the car wash. But for now, it's probably organ by organ. So every or so you have to protect each of the organs so that we don't know which are going to be first. It's to educate your friends and family about how crazy Dr. Roizen is um, and to think about for the probable demographic shifts. Because instead of having grandparents, parents, and children, it's going to be great, great, great grandparents, great grandparents, grandparents, parents, and children. Right, and that changes a whole bunch. Um, family, you know, divorce isn't going to stop. You're still going to hate some of those people. Um, the intended outcome is to give you a thought piece, um, and to, in the middle part of the book, we talk about policy changes and demographic changes and housing changes you may want to think about. But it's all because I love doing that. It's all because of that exponential increase in longevity. Um, now, people often say, well, what about COVID-19? Didn't it decrease life expectancy? And the answer is, here's the 1917, and you don't even see a bump anyway, right? And that decreased life expectancy in the year it occurred by 12 years in both men and women. But within a year, it rebounded. And in fact, as I'll show you a little bit, we've already got some longevity benefit from the science that has gone into the COVID vaccines. So in addition, the, the key point on this is that's what's called period life expectancy. You've seen the CDC said life expectancy went down about two years now. That's assuming that COVID-19 will kill you at the same rates it killed American populations every year going forward. It's not the way life expectancy should be calculated. It should be calculated, we think, based on cohort. What's the life expectancy of your age people going forward? rather than what's the life expectancy from the diseases that killed people last year. Um, so you don't even see that um, on the curves. <coughs> OK, so there are 14 areas I keep telling you about. We've gone through one gene editing. But one of the most interesting is what we call senolytics. 
Um, that's taking away senile cells. So when you're born, even in utero, we, you produce old cells that if they weren't harvested would make the cells around them old. But we can't find them lasting more than a few minutes in people under the age of 30. Your, their immune systems get rid of them. We don't know why 30 is the magic age, but at age 30, you stop getting rid of them, and they make the cells around them old. So the, question, the theory has been, why don't we get rid of them? Now, this really started um, in a, with giving an old rat a young rat's blood. And the, when you give a old rat a young rat's blood, the old rat becomes younger. And if you hook them up together, the young rat becomes older. So it was thought, that's the Conboys did that at UC San Francisco in 1967, and they spent the, the next 45 to 50 years, as did other people, trying to find out what is it in young blood that keeps that old rat or makes that old rat young. But it turns out it wasn't something in the young rat, it's something in the old rat that getting rid of it makes him young. And that's what they get rid of the senile proteins and senile cells. So this, and, and by the way, the Conboys did this in mice two years ago, um, where they gave the young mouse, they had donate a unit of blood and get back saline, get back salt water. And what happened with that old mouse? He got young, a lot younger. And the more they did that transfusion, that therapeutic plasma exchange, as we call it, the younger he got. And did he get young in muscles? Yes. Did he get young in skin? Yes. Did his cardiovascular system act younger? Yes. Did his brain act younger? Yeah, he ran mazes better. Did his, when you biopsied his pancreas, his liver, his kidney, every organ they could biopsy, it was a younger organ. They're now doing that in a prospective study. So all of these 14 areas are moving into human trials now. They're now doing that in humans, both at UC San Francisco and Stanford experimentally. But in the meantime, the makers of the equipment that does plasma exchange, it's not expensive. We pay graduate students to donate plasma, right? It's not expensive, but the maker of that equipment started an experiment in people with early dementia. And what it is is this. This person donates her blood. She, they wash the red cells and give them back to her. They throw away the plasma. They either give her new plasma or new saline. It didn't make any difference in the outcome. And what happened? Well, it's called the AMBAR studies, if you want to Google it. It's all the references are on the book. And what it did is, in every domain of cognitive functioning, it reversed it. Randomized controlled trial. So this is mild Alzheimer's disease. It's reversing it. So that she donated, these people donated, who were in the study, um, donated a unit of plasma once a week for five weeks, then once a month for four months. So nine donations over five months. And over 15 months, you can see a significant reversal of dementia. It's the first dementia reversal we really have. And the FDA has, there, by the way, six centers did this, 300 patients. Uh, two in Spain, two in Chile, uh, one in, at the University of Pittsburgh, one at Cleveland Clinic. And um, now it's a 3,000, they've started a second study. The FDA has said they will give them 
approval to market as a reversal of uh, dementia if it happens in the larger 3,000 person study that's now in 100 centers. So if you want to, you can probably Google AMBAR and find out how to enroll in it. Um, the, and this is the point of getting rid of senile cells. Well, senile cells put out a hormone. You say, why do they make the cells around them old? Well, we probably evolved it, the theory or the hypothesis is, because what made us old in the olden days was you got stabbed by a horn, or is that me? Oh, you're doing it to make it visual. Thanks. Um, so you got stabbed, and you wanted a, you didn't want normal cells, you wanted to form a scab over that, or you wanted to form a connective tissue so you'd heal and wouldn't bleed out. So that's why it was thought that the reason an, an old cell called for help, if you will, so you'd form a scab and stop the bleeding. That's the thought. But it puts out this abnormal protein which signals to cells around it, stop functioning so you form a scab. Well, now you can say, okay, let's get a vaccine against that protein so we can kill old cells as fast as your immune system does them up to age 30. And that's what's being tried. It works in mice. We don't know if it'll work in another species. Usually things get tried in two species before they move to humans. So that's uh, that one. Um, we've talked about gene editing. Um, the next one I, I'll talk about is how do you make your telomeres longer in, from your stem cells? So telomeres are the end of your chromosomes which allow you to reproduce that cell. But there's a limit. It's called the Hayflick limit. Um, a guy named Hayflick got the Nobel Prize for it. But the limit is you only get 70 to 140 duplications of your stem cells. So you're a pale white woman. Did you ever get, yeah, did you ever get sunburn? Yeah, you used up your stem cells healing that sunburn. So that's the problem. We use the stem cells. The reason we get to hospitals quickly after you have a heart attack is to open up blood flow. That does two things. One, it helps the marginal cells recover, but it also allows the signal of the dead cells to call your stem cells there and say, repair it. So if you, listen, if you look at the data on, on uh, heart attacks, someone has a heart attack, they have a decreased ejection fraction right away, and then it improves. How, why does it improve? because those darn stem cells repair it and start functioning like normal heart cells. Well, if you've used them up with sunburn, you don't have them to repair. Um, and how did we know that this occurred? It actually occurs with heart transplants. If you've got a male heart in a female body and that male heart has a heart attack, who repairs it? The female stem cells. So the point is you call forth. So the reason you get to a hospital fast after a stroke or after a heart attack is not only to recover the blood flow immediately, but is to get your stem cells and growth factors there so that you can repair it, if you will, with your own stem cells. But we have limited stem cells. So the question is how do we repair things as we get older? We don't now. But if we could just regenerate those telomeres, those endpoints, you could repair it and have infinite stem cells. Um, and this is a novel hyperbaric oxygen therapy that started in Israel. It's now at the villages in Florida as well as five other places around the world because when they did this, the people recovered from their stroke with a 70 or 80% improvement in functioning. It's not just hyperbaric oxygen. It's 
a novel way of giving it that stimulates stem cell reproduction, that increases the telomeres. What's the novel way? Well, when you get a lack of oxygen, it's one of the, when you, these old guys don't get it, but when you get a lack of oxygen, all of a sudden your stem cells say, hey, let's reproduce. Why? Because it says, hey, we're going to have some dead cells pretty soon. They're going to need us. So when you get down to what we call 0.4 atmospheres of oxygen, when you get a low oxygen level, you start to reproduce your telomeres. Well, this guy, Shai Fadi in Israel, said, why don't we do this going from two liters to one liter and see how the body reacts. And the body reacts exactly as if you went from one liter to half a liter. It's tricking the body into saying, hey, one liter, there's no risk to you, but at one liter, you start to reproduce your stem cells and to make more telomeres. And by the way, not only do you repair brain, you repair every other organ while you're doing this. And um, this is just to show you, you repair skin, because people always ask me about skin. Um, so your skin gets to look younger too. Um, another one of these 14 areas we went to is proteostasis. And we talked about um, both Viagra and Bumex, Bumetamide, um, the $4 water pill blocking those proteins. Um, let me give you another one. This is actually my co-author Albert Ratner's favorite one because um, it occurs in three animal species now and is starting to be in humans. When you're young, when you're newborn, you have what is called brown fat. It's brown because there are many more mitochondria in it. Those are energy factories. And they take fat and sugar and turn it into heat. And why do you want that when you're young? Because your mom isn't swaddling you all the time and you might get cold. So the brown fat is there to keep you warm. It comes from what we call mother fat or pluripotent fat. When we're old, we get fat hanging off our bellies that causes inflammation. Where does it come from? Same mother fat. So would it be possible to change the epigenetic switches and reverse white fat into pluripotent fat and then turn that into brown fat? and you'd eliminate obesity and much of type 2 diabetes, much of osteoarthritis, et cetera. And so it's now been done in three animal species, the largest of which is sheep. Anyone know why they would do it in sheep? Turns out sheep don't stop eating either. And um, they develop non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Same thing humans do that is bad for us. And then you can't get wool from them. So Clemson University, their veterinary research group said, hey, let's do what they did in rats and guinea pigs and take it into sheep and voila, they're able to do it. And, turn, and the sheep get thin again um, and keep producing wool. So Maybe we can re do this in humans. They think it's less than five years away, which if you eliminate obesity means um, that you want to sell Weight Watchers stock and buy haagen stock. <laughs> <laughs> um, so anyway, that's why it's the favorite of my co-author. He loves ice cream. Um, another area is... Um, and this is what we call epigenetic reprogramming. And this is the, the going in the car wash at one end already. So the, if you, I don't know if you can see this. Up, oh, yeah, there it is. This is 
the DNA damage you acquire over the decades. If you turn on these four genes, you repair it. That won the Nobel Prize for a guy named Yamanaka in Japan. Um, so Yamanaka in Japan and a guy named Mike West in the US did it the same week. Mike West patented it, Yamanaka got the Nobel Prize for it, and the, these are known as the Yamanaka factors. Um, and what, did that, what happens when you do it with an old mouse? He becomes young and he lives 50% longer. And what happens to their organs? They look young. You say, well, what's wrong with it? Well, the problem is that when you do this to a 100 to a hundred week old mouse, he becomes a 40 week old mouse, but by 44 weeks, he develops cancer four more weeks, two, three more human years. Not a good result, right? You don't want to be 40 again if you're going to develop cancer in a short period of time. But three groups have found out that if they only did these three factors and didn't do C-Mike, the 100, uh, I am fine, don't worry. She's holding up a sign five minutes. Um, the 100-week-old uh, mouse, I'm having too much fun to stop now. The 100-week-old mouse becomes 40-week-old and doesn't develop cancer at week 44. In fact, they're now 43 weeks into this without these group of mice developing cancer. And they've done this in guinea pigs. The mice was done at a place near uh, UC Davis. The guinea pigs were done in Switzerland, and another group of mice and rats have been done at Coleco, which is the Google moonshot on aging. So it's now been reproduced three times, um, and this is, you go in the car wash at 90, come out 40. Can it be done more than once? We don't know, because those mice that were uh, 107 and rebooted back to 40, are now only at 83 weeks. So they haven't tried it to see whether you can do it again. Um, what about for you? Well, this is data from Dean Ornish and Pete Carroll's study. Um, and it's a, what's called a heat map. So these are strips of genes on 52 guys who had prostate cancer. And here they go from, it's called a heat map because when they're red, those genes are active, they're producing um, proteins. When they're green, they're off. So they took these genes that were on to off over a one year period. What was the intervention that was done? By the way, these are the same 52 guys, 52 strips of genes. What was the intervention that was done? Well, the three guys who smoke quit smoking, they all walked 10,000 steps morning and night, 10,000 steps, sorry, a day. They did 15 minutes of meditation morning and night, and they eliminated five foods from their diet. What genes did they turn off over here? These are the RAS family of genes that promote the growth of prostate, breast, and colon cancer. They took them from on to off. And what did they do up here where they were off? and turned on, well, subsequently they found these were the GSTM1 genes that produce, the, they produce the GSTM1 proteins that cause prostate, breast, and colon cancer to commit suicide. Could anyone do that? Yeah, you get to control your switches to a huge degree. By the way, it's now 14 years later and when you talk to Pete Carroll last year, only one of the 52 guys has progressed beyond this lifestyle treatment for their prostate cancer, as opposed to 31 of the 52 in the comparison group. It's not randomized controlled. You, and it's the same thing for breast and colon cancer, you get to control a huge amount of how long and well you live now. 
So my points that I'd like to, you to take home, one, you are a genetic engineer. Um, change your attitude. What you do matters. Um, and if you look at their 30, there are 33 things in prostate, uh, 33 things that protect your brain, um, one of which is speed of processing games. So you click the start, and either the truck or the car appears behind the start sign. You have to identify that. And someplace in the periphery there, the Route 66 sign appears, and you have to identify that. And it's timed, as you see. There's a time. If you miss it, you get more time. You get it right, you get less time. And it trains you to work your brain faster. That, 18 hours over 10 years, roughly two hours a year, decreases dementia risk in people 73 to 83, that is, they started at age 73, did it for 10 years by over 40%. Now three randomized controlled trials showing that. So we want you to add speed to your brain games. Does crossword puzzles help? No, not much. How about executive function games or decision games? They help a little bit, but no place near the 40%. Um, so those speed of processing games. Um, how about moving your body? This is aerobic exercise, and people who did do it three months. This is the hippocampus before. This is the hippocampus, side view, front view, brain. Afterwards, 22% increase in, six in three months of doing that. Is 10,000 the right number? Yeah. Um, it was chosen by a Japanese pedometer manufacturer to sell more pedometers, but he happened to guess right. Um, that is, is 6,000 better than 4,000? Yes. Is 8,000 better than 6? Yes. But it's 10 that's the ideal spot. It doesn't matter whether you're a man or woman, doesn't matter your age, doesn't matter your ethnicity, it's 10,000. And that's the number that stops ischemic stroke, heart disease, diabetes, breast, and colon cancer. And it's the same for pre-diabetics and diabetics. It's 10,000. And um, it means that if you do six, that if you do 10,000 steps a day, that probably gives you the maximum benefit of all exercise as far as your brain. And by the way, this is another set of studies randomly again, but it turned out it was 98. 63, that's as close to 10,000 as any of us can get, 9,863 steps a day. Um, so which genes are on or not, that's your choice. And if you're going to do one thing, it is speed of processing or two things, it's speed of processing games for both your brain and speed for your muscle. Um, so change your attitude. You're a genetic engineer. Food is a relationship like a marriage. You wouldn't marry someone who's trying to kill you every day. You shouldn't eat food that's trying to kill you every day. You may love french fries, but they're out to get you. Not a good choice. Avocado or salmon, much better choices. You need a team. Nobody, none of the physicians I know would do a colonoscopy on themselves. You shouldn't try and do things you're not a pro at um, yourself and you want. Add speed to your body and brain. Most important things you can do is have a posse, that is friends. So say hello to the people around you tonight um, and a passion. Um, thank you for letting me share my passion, which is trying to get people to live longer, younger. Um, <laughs> Thank you so much, Dr. Rosen. We do have a handful of questions for you. Good. Um, let's see. Okay. First question: Can you explain impact of meats versus fish on longevity? Yeah. So you end up not only changing the which genes are on in you, but you change them in your gut by what you eat. So when you eat red meat you change the epigenes of the bacteria inside you to turn on and produce an inflammatory protein. Fish doesn't do it, red meat does it. 
Why? Who knows? But it does it. It changes which of the genes in the bacteria inside you are on. And when you eat red meat, it turns on the genes that, produ that the bacteria produce an inflammatory protein called trimethylamine, which you absorb and get the trimethylamine oxide and causes you heart disease, stroke, memory loss, impotence, wrinkling of your skin, and dementia. So that's why red meat's bad. Red meat is bad and processed red meat. And by the way, it isn't the cholesterol in it. It's the carnitine, lecithin, and choline combined with saturated fat. You have lecithin pills and don't have saturated fat at the same time? No problem. You have lecithin and you have saturated fat, butter at the same time? Bingo. You're the, you change the genes in those bacteria. Who, why it happens that way, we don't know, but it does. And it doesn't happen every every bacteria. It's only about 80% of you have those bacteria, 82% of you have those bacteria that do it. And you can get a cheap blood test called trimethylamine oxide after you eat a piece of red meat, two pieces of red meat in a week. Sometime in the next week you get the blood test. If you don't have a high trimethylamine oxide level, you're lucky those bacteria didn't change in you and you can keep eating red meat. On the other hand, the 82% of you have a high level of trimethylamine oxide, cut out red meat, processed red meat, egg yolks. Alrighty, thank you. Yeah, egg yolks do the same thing. Mm. They have both saturated fat and lecithin in them, which again, it's carnitine. So people always say, what about pork? It's the other white meat, wrong. Um, my, my cousin did this. Uh, she's my anti-person. Um, she went to work for the California um, Milk Authority and said, got milk, you know, that campaign got milk. She started that out in California. My kids are the beneficiaries of it, the only ones that I know of, because my daughter has a seven-foot Patrick Ewing and my son is a seven-foot Raquel Welsh with the got milk on it when they were growing up. She then went to Wisconsin and did it nationally for the milk board. She then got hired by Edelman and came up with the slogan, pork the other white meat. It is not, it's a red meat. What was her next job uh, when she retired from it? She became the chief knowledge officer at Coca-Cola selling sugared water to poor kids around the world. <laughs> so she's my anti, the good news is she's retired and I haven't. <laughs> okay. Uh, what is your opinion on daily supplemental vitamins? Uh, daily supplemental vitamins. If you've only got 10 years to live, don't bother, unless you care about your brain. So the randomized control trials showed no benefit for cancer prevention or heart disease at 10 years, but major benefits by 20 years. What was the major benefit? 18% reduction in cancer, 25% reduction in heart disease. Huge benefits at 20 years. Two weeks ago, a study came out. If you go to our website, greatagereboot.com, you can sign up for our newsletter because we write about it this week. It comes out Friday, um, the newsletter. So um, three randomized trial of cocoa, multivitamins versus placebo. So one group got placebo, placebo. One group got the cocoa and placebo. One group got multivitamins and placebo. The fourth group got cocoa and the multivitamin, the group that got the multivitamins, 13% decrease in cognitive dysfunction. So over the period of time in three years. So the only thing, so I'm in favor of half a multivitamin twice a day. Why half twice a day? Because if you look in the, ur in, the, in the urinal, you see that the color changes pretty fast. So in order to have a stable level, you want half twice a day. So you cut it in half. Just to piggyback off that, I'm just curious about the difference between one multivitamin with everything in it or taking the separate vitamins. Oh, it's, it's, so, it's too tough to take the separate ones. If you're taking separate ones other than, you, you, most multivitamins don't have enough vitamin D in them. So if you're taking, if you, if you, if you get your level measured and you find it's low, you're gonna have to get added vitamin D, but most of the other stuff is fine and you want to take um, 
some things you want to take separately. So if you if you need iron, which most of us don't need supplemental iron, but if you need it, you need to take it at a separate time than the vitamin C and the multivitamin. But there there's some small tricks. But for most people, half a multivi multivitamin, multimineral twice a day is what you want, and then you may have to supplement with vitamin uh, D. If you're if you're a uh, if you really care about it, look on the label to see if it's got mixed tocopherols or just alpha tocopherol. It probably is the mixed tocopherols, which is the vitamin E. Vitamin E is really eight tocopherols combined. Most companies sell their vitamin as a uh, just a alpha tocopherol because it's cheaper for them to make, but it isn't get the full vitamin E. So if you wanted to do that correctly, you look at the multivitamin to make sure it's got mixed tocopherols and not just alpha tocopherol in it. Thank you. Okay. I'm going to ask these two together because they, they're kind of related and I want to really try and get through all of them. Um, what do you eat every day and what is your exercise routine every day? Um, let me let me just go to the end. I'm going to skip to the end so you can see. You can, you can ask me questions after this at greatagereboot.com. So um, we do a set of questions every week. Um, the uh, what do I eat every day? I usually don't eat till 10 a.m. Uh, 11 a.m. Sorry, I usually eat between 11 and 7. Um, and I this is crazy. Um, I'm going to tell everybody what I eat, but I normally have a salmon burger and a vegetable for lunch. Uh, that's my lunch, and then at dinner I usually have a salad and um, vegetable, or two, or three, or four, or five. Okay, and so and that's and uh, olive oil and walnuts on the salad, etc., and and so blueberries on the salad as well. So, I I if you looked at the thirty three things you can do for your brain, I do all of those as much as I can anyway. And your exercise routine. Exercise, I don't go to bed without 10,000 steps. Um, so I'm a little short right now, but I'll get it because I was on planes for a long time today. Um, but I'll get it. And uh, I don't go to bed without 10,000 steps. And then uh, three times a week, I will do uh, cardio. Uh, I, I, this is crazy. So I do 48 minutes at 80 plus percent of my age adjusted max and then for the last two minutes I go all out. Um, you say why 48 minutes because I used to play a lot of a game of squash and I'm going to get back to it and the typical uh, finals games were 48 minutes of, of intense and so I keep thinking I'm going to get back to it. Um, the uh, and the third thing I do is weightlifting twice a week uh, and I, I've been doing the same I mean this is you know, many people get bored with the same routine. I've been doing the same routine for uh, 15 different muscle groups, but it's basically core muscles um, twice a week for 20 minutes. Can you talk about sugar in our diets? Yeah, sugar's bad. <laughs> okay. Now, there may be, we're beginning to think that two rare sugars Trilose and allulose may inhibit the uptake of glucose and sucrose into your body and that they may be beneficial. There are early studies on this, but the studies look pretty darn good. And so it may be that you can uh, buy allulose or trilose and get the sweetness without getting any of the harmful effects of regular what you call table sugar, or any of the other sugars, so any of the other oses. But that those two, so um, those are, uh, where do you get allulose from? It turns out it's high in dates and it's high in raisins as well, um, and a few other foods, and triolose is in some rare foods too. Um, we didn't used to pay any attention to them because you couldn't make them easily synthetically. And they're obviously too expensive to purify raisins and dates. But um, it turns out uh, two guys in Japan have figured out how to make them as well. And so they're now um, readily available over the last four years. So they're being studied. 
what negative consequences? By the way, these are great questions. So is a, this is a really they intelligent are. group <laughs> here, Tracy. What negative consequences yeah. do you anticipate by increasing life expen expectancy? Well, the compounding effect means that good decisions last longer and are more beneficial, but it also means bad decisions last longer and are worse. So if you, um, if you gain a half a pound a year and you're only going to live 30 years, that's 15 pounds, not bad. But if you're going to live 70 more years, that's 35 pounds and a lot more problem. We may cure that, obviously, with the brown, white fat to brown fat. But in any case, um, in the short term, what it means is um, a lot of it get, and if we don't do the right policy rules, economically, it's worse. So we don't have enough kids right now to support uh, the older generations. It isn't just the US. It's the world doesn't have enough. I mean, the only places that are, have enough kids to support the elderly are places in Africa and a couple in Latin America. Um, but the rest of the world doesn't have enough kids to, in, in meaning if you said the only working age is 20 to 65, we don't have enough people to support us. Medicare trust funds going to go belly up, and so security trust funds are going to go belly up if that's it. Longevity solves that if we do it right. Um, longevity means your working life won't be 25 to 65, it'll be 25 to 85, because you're not going to want to retire at 65 and do nothing for 50 years. So um, if we do it right. Now, Australia, Singapore, and Denmark have a savings plan. They force you, in addition to their Medicare and Social Security, to put 3% of your salary into a account they guarantee will accumulate at 4% per year. Well, if you do that and you're 22 and do it to 65, you have $257,000. If you do it to 95, you have 1.4 million in today's dollars. And if you do it in a firm that matches it, like the Cleveland Clinic does, it's 2.8 million. That does away with a lot of wealth inequality if we did that. And guess what? Well, we were doing the galleys for this book in uh, June or in May. It turned out the House of Representatives, in a bipartisan fashion, passed that like 420 to 12. It's now in front of the Senate. So it is, so 3% of a $15 per hour income adds up to a huge amount because of the compounding effect. So that's a good thing. If we don't do it right, and we say, okay, you can still retire at 65 or not work or whatever, then it makes wealth inequality worse. And if you do unhealthy things, the compounding effect makes them worse. So that's the negative of longevity. But basically though, for any of us who do things uh, pretty well, um, longevity is the cure, not the problem for society or societies worry about pensions, worry about health long term. Okay. And I'm sorry, we only have time for one last question. I apologize if we didn't get to your question, um, but I want to make sure we can do the raffle and have time to um, have Dr. Rosen sign any books. So our last question, um, in your book, you said the brain is hard to reboot. Can you expand on this? Yeah, so that we don't, I mean, we know pretty well how to reboot most other organs pretty reliably. Until the AMBAR studies, the senolytic study, remember where you do therapeutic plasma exchange, we had nothing for the brain, and we still don't for the spinal cord. We know how to prevent it. I said there are 33 things that have been shown in at least two studies in humans. Things as simple as smelling four smells a day um, and making sure you smell four different smells a day. Um, and there, as well as, you know, a tablespoon and a half of olive oil a day, et cetera. And in addition to my favorite of speed of processing and speed to your body, as well as a posse and a passion. Um, but the brain is by far the one that is the toughest to know what to do about. 
Um, and it obviously is one that most of us worry about losing capacity. Um, people often ask me, by the way, and I'm going to do one extra question, even though you didn't. People often ask, when do you start therapeutic plasma exchange? Well, we'll know in a couple of years, because this study has started already, the 3,000 person study, of, is it reliable? But if I had early dementia now, I would find a way of donating plasma at a routine basis right now. And a lot of, a lot of Red Crosses would love you. Interesting. Thank you. Thank you so much for answering all those questions. My privilege. So we do want to do um, our raffle, and would you do the honors of, of pulling two raffle tickets? You should, okay, I'll, I'll pull. Um, Just read the number. Oh, geez. 7966831. Awesome. Let's take a look. Yeah. 7966831. It's a match. Congratulations. There you go. All right. Come up to the table and I'll sign it. And one more. You should pick one. No, you do it. <laughs> um, oh, this one's a different uh, 042-724. Big numbers on this one. 024-042-724. You got it. Awesome. Where do you want me to sit? Um, if you want to go around this way. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you all for being here. If you'd like to participate, yes. please exit through the glass doors where Rosemary's standing. Rosemary, can you open them? The line's going to come this way. You can purchase a book and have Dr. Royzen sign it. Um, if I did not get to your question, that would be an awesome time for you to ask him your question. Thank you all for being here.